Welcome everyone and good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. Wherever that is, I do hope that you're staying safe and healthy. My name is Mark Horney and I'm a member of the Career Management Center team here at CBS, where I head up career leadership and development function. On behalf of the Dean's Office, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the next in our Leading Through Crisis series of Community Conversations. Today, we're delighted to welcome Michael Corbett, Chief Executive Officer of Citigroup, who will discuss the impact of the global pandemic on the financial services industry and offer us some management lessons and career guidance. Mr. Corbett has been at Citi and its predecessor companies since his graduation from Harvard University with a bachelor's degree in economics in 1983. Prior to his current role, he was CEO of Europe, Middle East, and Africa, where he oversaw all of Citi's business operations in the region, including consumer banking, corporate and investment banking, securities trading, and private banking services. Previously, Mr. Corbett served as the CEO of City Holdings, City's portfolio of non-core businesses and assets, and he's also served as the CEO of City's Global Wealth Management Unit and was head of the Global Corporate and Global Commercial Bank. I'm also thrilled to welcome Amanda Chen, a second year MBA student at CBS, who will moderate the conversation with Mr. Corbett today. Prior to CBS, Amanda spent five years working in the fast-growing consumer goods space, two years at Coca-Cola Refreshments in a sales leadership development program, and three years at General Mills in brand management, where she worked on brands such as Pillsbury, Totino's, and Progresso. She holds a BA in economics from Northwestern University, and <clears throat> after graduation from CBS in May, she will join the Estee Lauder Company's Presidential Management Associate Program in New York City. To top that off, Amanda served impressively this year as the president of the board for our CMC Fellows, a group of more than 60 second year MBA students offering peer career advice to first year students. With that, I want to welcome you again. Thanks for joining us and let me turn you over to Amanda. Thanks so much, Mark. And Mike, welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us. We really, really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Mark, thank you. And Amanda, hello. Excellent. And one quick note to all of our attendees. You probably saw a notice in the chat box, but as we're going, please feel free to post questions in Q&A. I'm going to ask Mike some questions for the beginning of our conversation, and then we'll pull in all of your questions. But to kick things off, Mike, can you tell us a little bit about your career path at Citi, and in particular, your experiences during the financial crisis and running Citi Holdings? Sure. So, uh, as Mark mentioned, I've been with our company for 37 years. I started at one of our predecessors, which was Solomon Brothers, in 1983 in sales and trading, and uh, held a series of jobs in the sales, trading, capital markets, banking businesses. Uh, which um, ultimately kind of came together uh, during the crisis. And uh, during the crisis, what happened is that Citigroup had been formed in the late 1990s as really a financial supermarket, bank, insurance company, asset manager, hedge fund, really a bit of everything. Uh, and in the crisis, that was tested. And we made the decision that we would uh, redesign the company. We would reconfigure the company and in many ways go back to our roots. And our roots really uh, were steeped in being a bank uh, and a global bank, uh, a company that operates in, in uh, then and still today, about 100 countries around the world. And uh, somebody was needed to go take all of the pieces that were non-core, about 80 operating businesses in about 45 countries, about 100,000 employees, about $800 billion of assets. To put that in perspective, uh, if that were a standalone company, it would have been bigger than Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, GE Capital, or a number of, of businesses, and figure out the right way that we could shed uh, or streamline our business from, from those businesses, and at the same time, not be disruptive to the go-forward company, to our clients, and, and to our people. And so it was a, an interesting case, uh, test case, because nothing like that had ever been done before, certainly to that magnitude. And so there was, there was no playbook to go to. Uh, and it was very different to come to work uh, after having um, spent most of my career building 
fixing and building different things to come actually take some things apart and to, and to try and do that. And the first thing I had to do was recruit a team to come in and help me do it. And uh, as you can imagine, it's not the easiest thing to say, hey, why don't you come join me, take these things apart. And our, our, our big objective is to work ourselves out of a job as quickly as we can. Uh, and to be able to do that in a in, in an environment un as uncertain as it was during the during the financial crisis, and I think that in that the lessons, the management lessons, the people lessons learned in doing that, uh, I think have proven certainly invaluable to me. But I think the people who were on that journey with me, and in many ways, I think has shaped our company, and in many ways, I think has certainly shaped my leadership style today. I'm sure. Thank you. Though we're likely still in the early stages of this crisis, from your perspective, how is the current situation different from the financial crisis of 08? Well, I think first we've got to, we've got to ground this that way it was a financial crisis. And really, this is a health crisis that has significant economic ramifications. And I think we've got to recognize that until we deal with an attempt to solve some of the health crisis or health issues in this, it's going to be very difficult to have the ability to fully address the economic fallout that's occurred uh, as part of this. And so uh, last time, I think what, what's different for, for city and I think what's different from the financial services industry is last time financial services was at the center of the crisis. And I think this time the, the financial system and in particular the banking system and the big banks are really at the place of, uh, in many ways, being what I call a, a critical transmission mechanism between uh, government and real economy actions and obviously supporting customers and clients. And so while the banks, I think, were, were at the center of the crisis last time as part of the problem, uh, I think this time we're very much there, hopefully, as part of the, the solution and the, and, the, and the fix and the cure to this. Absolutely. I'd love to dive in a little bit deeper with some questions regarding the economy and the financial services industry. So first, how is COVID-19 impacting the global economy? Well, I think we, we just look at um, today as an example in terms of the, the fact that we're all doing this remotely. And that if you look at the U.S. economy, um, I've seen numbers uh, ranging as high as about you know 95% of the global GDP is working working from somewhere remotely. And so that there's really been no geography, um, there's been no segment, there really haven't been any industries that haven't been impacted by this. And so I think this is uh, in some ways in the modern era, a, a first of its kind, hopefully last of its kind, but first of its kind in terms of something that, that comes as quickly as it has and has had the breadth of impact uh, on people, on business, and 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 certainly on on um, on, on behaviors. Absolutely. What do you believe the role of the financial services industry is in this current crisis? Well, I, I, that, that that in this, um, I think we've we've got a couple roles. I think we have our uh, usual but important role in terms of servicing our customers and clients. And clearly, this is a a period of not just economic stress, but personal stress. And so from how do we have the ability to serve our consumer clients around the world in terms of the challenges they, they have in terms of their credit cards, their mortgage, their student debt, kind of all of those, and, and how do we, we work with them in those challenging times to small business all the way through the big multinationals, meeting payroll, uh, having access to liquidity, foreign exchange, uh, markets, supply chain, uh, uh, really all of those. And then I think there's the, um, the role that I mentioned earlier in terms of being this intermediary, the transmission mechanism. We've seen certainly out of the US government, but many governments around the world, just extraordinary actions in terms of monetary and fiscal policy. And uh, the average small business, the average consumer, the average big business doesn't have access directly to the U.S. Treasury or have direct access to the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England or whoever it may be. And so the banks, and in particular the big banks, really play the role of that transmission mechanism 
of bringing those programs to life. You know, as an example, the Federal Reserve has you know, put in trillions of dollars of liquidity into the market. We've acted as the catalyst for that, you know, right through today to the implementation of the Small Business payment, uh, Payroll Protection Program, where, you know, getting out $350 billion to small business in a short period of time uh, couldn't have happened without the banking system playing its role. Sure. Digging a little bit deeper into the Fed's actions, do you believe recent Fed moves have helped to ease the strains in the markets? Oh, without a doubt. I think if you go back to the darkest days of, of March, what we were really experiencing in there in many ways was a, a bit of a liquidity crisis, but that liquidity crisis quickly turned into a credit crisis. And so you really needed to see uh, what I believe was a, a two-stage a series of efforts from the Treasury and the Fed. One was to, to get in and provide liquidity. We had money funds that were uh, meeting challenges around redemptions. We had certain parts of the market that had, uh, that had locked up. Uh, but ultimately what happened is once the liquidity was solved, it very much became uh, a credit challenge. And then you've seen uh, the Fed and the Treasury, and you've seen other central banks and, um, and monetary agencies around the world acting in terms of trying to get lending going into the real economy. And so again, the payroll protection plan was there. Uh, I've been on the phone this morning with the Fed and the Treasury talking about its next big program, which is its Main Street lending program. It'll be an additional $600 billion going to to larger businesses along the way to help with some of the challenges that are that are there, uh, and and so I think that um, I I truly commend uh, both our Federal Reserve and our Treasury in terms of the actions that they've taken so far. Truly extraordinary. That's really great to hear. What are your thoughts on the CARES Act and other actions governments have taken to bolster the economy? Well, I think on the on the back of that, I think they've 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 been powerful, and you know, from our perspective, the way we look at it is this is this is not a, a crisis that you can think of as really being the same everywhere, because the timing and pace of the virus, the contagion rate, and hopefully as it rolls over and starts to come down, as we've seen in parts of Asia, the impact that it's had. Uh, on economies has been different. The responses have been different uh, from governments. You know, uh, many governments don't have the wherewithal of the U.S. or some of the other more advanced economies to really go at these in extraordinary ways. Uh, and so it really is, as a, as a company that operates in 100 countries, we really see a fairly wide dispersion in terms of the way that uh, the governments and societies have gone at that. And I think each of them is driving different outcomes. And we need to make sure as a company that we are uh, engaged and that we are going at each of those uh, in a very particular or very specific way. How are you continuing to serve your clients and customers during this very challenging time? Well, I think first is engagement. Right, that we, you know, we, we as a company had a, a bit of a benefit in that we operate a big business in Asia. And so, um, like many U.S. individuals or companies, we didn't start dealing with this in March. We were dealing with it in January. So we had the benefit, if you would call it that, of having the experience of live through and have had the, the uh, ability to test certain things. And I think a couple things, you know, right away is one is that the safety of our employees was first and foremost, but also understanding that the changes that were necessary as part of this were going to change people's lives, change the course of business and early engagement. And so outreach. So as an example, in the U.S., you saw us as the first first bank in early March to come out and engage and say that we're going to, around our consumer bank, begin waiving fees, begin certain forbearance programs, even though we really hadn't started feeling that impact in the first week of March. We had seen it, we knew it was coming, and we knew that early engagement was the right thing to do. So whether it's been individuals or whether it's been bigger businesses, 
and of being right up front and also sharing with them the benefit of what we had learned along the way in terms of what was likely to come and how they should be preparing themselves. What have you been hearing from clients about the impacts to their businesses? What are their primary concerns and challenges and how is City responding? Well, I think the, the, the concerns and challenges are the same to all of us. And that is, uh, I think in many ways, the difficulties of dealing with the uncertainty, the uncertainties of uh, lack of um, prolific testing, the uncertainties around um, when uh, and or what the nature and course of the trajectory of the virus will be, when it will turn, um, different uh, challenges around the mortality rates. And then um, that really causes the, the society to, that uncertainty uh, causes society in many ways to be on lockdown, that uh, we can't get out, we can't do things, we're hesitant to do things. And then obviously that has the ripple uh, effect. And so helping businesses try to deal with the challenges of that uncertainty, we certainly don't, and I haven't met the person yet who has the crystal ball that knows exactly where this goes. But I think it's around helping people and helping business plan for the contingencies and try and put as much normalcy and comfort back into lives and processes that we can. And again, I, I have to say that certainly from our company perspective, but I think also from a societal perspective, if we all would have said to each other a year ago, hey, guess what, a year from now, 90, 95% of the company or 95% of the world is going to be at, at some kind of stay at home. And um, we were able to do the types of things that we've done, uh, I think is extraordinary. You know, again, kind of going back to um, uh, the, the, the job that was just done in terms of the disbursement of $350 billion in the U.S., a number of these programs of making sure yesterday as checks started to go out, that they got into accounts and that people knew that they were there. The remote access. As a company of 200,000 people, we have over 180,000 of our colleagues working remotely right now. And to have the systems and the bandwidth and the technology to be able to support that uh, has been an extraordinary effort. But I've got to say, we as a company, and I certainly think uh, we as a society have, have risen to this challenge really in, a, in an extraordinary way. How is COVID-19 impacting sectors outside of banking? Well, you know, I think when you, when you look at, at banking, banking's um, kind of connected to all of the sectors. And, and again, when you think of the sectors that have been most affected, they, they've talked about a lot, but clearly the industries uh, in, in travel, airlines, lodging, uh, restaurants to, to a degree, uh, the entertainment space. So anything that's got typically high social density uh, has been has been affected. But by the way, it doesn't stop there. I don't I don't think there's uh, I'm having a hard time finding many, if any, industries that in some way haven't been impacted by this. So, you know, I, I don't think there's necessarily a safe refuge away from this. And so banking really being at the center and the in many ways, the connectivity uh, of the economy to those businesses. Uh, clearly, we've had to change the way we think about and do things as well. Of course. I'm curious, what does your day-to-day -day look like right now in the midst of this craziness? Well, uh, world headquarters is a little bit bigger than a closet. Um, you know, as a family perspective, we've had to kind of redefine our roles. Initially, we had a little bit of a fight around the internet, but we got that, that solved. But um, I would say away from travel and again, running a company that operates in as many places as we do, a lot of my time was traveling uh, out, to, out to our different locations. That's clearly stopped, but uh, my day typically starts with engagement with my team in terms of uh, planning, not just the things we're gonna get done that day, but the intermediate and into the future. Uh, lots of client outreach, again, with this uncertainty, uh, making sure that our clients know that we're here, we're here for them, we're, we're supporting them in the things that they do. Again, I think having the ability to share some of the lessons that we've learned along the way uh, of what this is likely to feel 
feel like and how it's likely to play forward. Uh, and then just trying to stay as connected as I can. As, um, as an example, you know, with many of our groups, uh, I've tried to host some video chats just to check in with them. Uh, I did one the other day with a group of our, our branch-based employees, our tellers, our heroes, right? That while we've all had the ability to social distance, uh, people still expect, understandably, to have access to their money in their bank. And we've got people who we're sending in every day and going into our sites and we're making sure that they've got the PPE necessary, masks and protective equipment and hand sanitizers and gloves to be able to perform their jobs. But just an outreach to them to check in with them and say thank you. And I think in this time, communication's everything. That um, being able to do a video chat or just a call to check in to, with people to see how they're doing and and to thank them for what they're doing, I think, uh, certainly to me, um, seems to resonate. That's really great to hear. What do you think work will look like once we make it through the crisis? And for those positions that are able to work remotely, is remote work here to stay? You know, it's a great question. And we spend a, a fair bit of time thinking and, and talking about that. Um, I don't th and I don't think that there's, there's necessarily a single answer to that. I think without a doubt, we will see some behaviors changed. As an example, um, in the banking industry, we've seen a, a uh, significant, significant uptake in terms of mobile digital banking. That you know, we had had people who were reluctant to bank on their devices and like to come into the branch or like to talk to people. Obviously, they can still talk to people. They can still come into the branch, but uh, given you know some of the, the the safety procedures and distancing, we've seen a great uptake. We so, certainly hope that sticks, because we've made significant investments into that infrastructure to have it there. It's a great experience, and I hope as people have the ability to take advantage of that and learn it and be comfortable with it, um, that the, that's something that sticks. I think there's aspects of of businesses that likely lend itself to the ability for, mo for more remote working in the future. But I also think there's parts of our business that, that don't. And you know, I would argue that in our business, when you have established relationships, it's much easier to have that remote re relationship. But if I'm in a business of out there trying to find and source new clients and win new business over, it's tough to beat face-to-face. Um, and I think that, that you know, we're, we're seeing that, that in the established business, it's fairly easy. But in terms of trying to go out and get those new relationships going, it's much tougher to do that uh, remotely. But I think, you know, without a doubt, we'll see some impact. But I, I'd say the other side and lessons that we're seeing in Asia, um, we see people chopping at the bit to, to come back. That, you know, as we've, we've, we've probably got about 60% of our workforce back in China, we've probably got about a third of our workforce back in Hong Kong. And as an example, in Hong Kong, where people are calling and wanting to come in and we're telling them, you know, please, you know, we're, we're trying to be smart about this, we want to be safe. And then I also think on the other side, that there'll be those people who I think struggle with this, and struggle in particular in urban areas with maybe not wanting to uh, subject themselves to uh, certain types of commutes or densely populated cities or office buildings. And I think we'll see some people coming out of that likely rethinking what, what they want their life experiences to be. And so I think, I think um, as businesses and society, I think we need to res respect that. And I think we need to be ready, ready for the change in some of those behaviors. Of course. What advice would you give on managing a team through a crisis? And I'm curious, what lessons have you learned from this experience so far? I, I think a, a great lesson um, and one that we learned very on and, and COVID personifies it is, and that is your, resp your responses can't be to where you are today, right? By the nature of this virus, if you go to where it is today, you're two to three weeks behind. And I think in many instances around the world, we've seen people taking that approach. And I think it's caused, it's caused, um, it's caused challenges and it's caused people to play catch up. You know, one of the things that we saw in, in the pace of this, the trajectory, 
that we had to get ahead of them. And so as an example, things that we did, which in probably in many ways seem strange, you know, back on January 28th, I, I canceled a big gathering of my global senior leadership team when no one was even speaking about COVID in the United States. Uh, in, uh, in around February 1st, early February, we started putting travel bans. And I can say that my inbox lit up with from less than happy people in terms of us uh, limiting or curtailing certain travel. But again, around the spread is we knew that it was likely coming. We knew that we had to get ahead of it. And we knew that we didn't want to risk having our own company pandemic in terms of having our people traveling out of or into contaminated regions. And so getting ahead of it. And so everything that we've tried to do since that lesson is to, again, not always right, but try to project forward in terms of where this thing is going and where is it going to be and make those decisions today. And by the way, they're not always right. They're not always perfect. But in this lesson learned, it's a lot easier to dial them back than it is to play catch up. And so I would say lesson one. Lesson two, and this is around communication, right? That um, we don't have the benefit of being in the same room. We don't have the benefit of some of the, the, the ways that we've done things in the past. And communication really becomes key in making sure that the linkages uh, are there between the people, between the teams. Uh, and it's not just the business side of things, but it's the human side of things. And that people having people understand that um, um, they 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 work for a company or they're part of an organization that really cares and cares in every sense. We've turned people's lives upside down. You know, we've got not only people working remotely, uh, we've got people who, in addition to their day jobs, have children home and they're homeschooling. <clears throat> we've got people taking care of parents or or other people. We've got people taking care of sick people. So how do we actually put programs in place that actually support our people in that way? So again, lessons learned. Uh, what we did is we said, you know, early on, if you're home <clears throat> and you need to be home, it's fine. You don't have to come into the office. You're still going to get paid. Because what we didn't want to do is encourage behavior around people fearing for pay or their jobs to come in when they were sick. Second thing we did is we looked at our people and said, we know you're going through extraordinary challenges. Uh, we went out to about 75,000 of our colleagues around the world and we, um, we, we, we got them some, some money. We went to our, our employees making less than $60,000 or the equivalent around the world. And we said, we're gonna get you thousand dollars just to help out with whatever it is that you need. In many cases, uh, our employees uh, are employed, they'll stay employed, but in many cases, spouses significant, others weren't. Uh, healthcare and kind of waiving some of the healthcare fees um, and just making sure that we could take as much stress out of their lives as we could and, and allow them to focus on the things that are important to them. <clears throat> That's great, thank you. So the importance of people and firms being flexible and seizing opportunities in the midst of this crisis are things we've heard many, many times over at CBS over the last few weeks. Keeping this in mind, how do you believe organizations need to adapt to survive this period of disruption? Well, one is that I think you've, you've, um, you've got to be flexible. I think you've got to have resi resiliency as part of this. Um, again, you know, uh, if we go through all kinds of contingency planning. But I can tell you, we never planned, and I haven't met the company yet, that planned that said we're going to have 80 or 90% of our people working from home. Right? We've had backup sites, we've had contingency facilities, but it's never been that we're sending people home. And so I think the, um, the ability to use that resiliency in a lot of different ways uh, I think I think is is critical because again, we don't we don't know exactly where this is going, and you know we we've got to prepare for a a series of outcomes here, and I think the flexibility uh, around that planning and the resiliency of your organization I think is what's going to separate those who come through this in a better way from those that don't. Absolutely. 
And you've shared a lot of really great examples of how a city is supporting its employees in the midst of the crisis. Is there anything that you haven't shared that <coughs> you want us to be aware of, of how you're supporting your team members? Well, I, I, you know, one is that, um, and I hope this resonates, is one of the things that we knew that was out there as well as not just our, our current employees are under stress, but our, our future employees are under stress. And I know that there's some in this audience today and, you know, around uh, our internship programs, we went back and told everybody, you have a job, the program will be shorter, but don't worry, you're going to get paid for your 10 weeks. And we're going to figure out creative ways to engage you. And we also said that in our major hubs, New York, uh, London, Hong Kong, Tokyo, et cetera, that if you come into our organization as an intern, uh, we're, and provided you come through that well, uh, which we expect people to do, at the end of it, you're going to have a job. So don't worry about that. Come in, give us your best, show us who you are, and we want to take that uh, stress out of people's life. You're going to have to be flexible because, again, we don't know exactly where we'll be by the time we start these programs. We delayed our programs until July to try and give us the benefit, hopefully, of of having people on site as opposed to to doing those internships remotely. But but again, I think trying to go out there and show the communities what we stand for, uh, not just as a business, but really as a human organization. That's excellent. Before we open it up to q and I have two final questions for you, Mike, related to some general career advice. So the first one, should graduating MBAs be prepared to face unemployment or underemployment? And if so, how long do you think that period could last? I would say that that, in my mind, I think is unfortunate, but it's, it's likely. Um, I don't know how long that'll last, but I would I would offer a couple words of advice. One is don't take it personal. Don't get too down on yourself, right? You're all uh, by your nature and by where you are. You're kind of highly motivated, highly focused people. Um, stay engaged with recruiters. Stay engaged and, and stay out there and, and don't give up on it. Um, I would probably go back and try and seek some advice or seek some counsel from somebody who went through this in the 08 crisis. Uh, because it wasn't dissimilar then in some ways. And what, what did that look and feel like? And how did they deal with it? And what kind of uh, advice they have? But, but I would say, you know, don't, don't give up on it. Hopefully, we've got the ability to turn this thing quickly. And we've got the ability around all the stimulus and the things that we talked about to bring the economy back. And I think there's going to be great jobs out there for people and obviously for, for people of your background and training. So you know, just don't get don't get too down on yourself, and that's going to be hard not to do uh, if if things become challenged in that way. And um, I'm confident things will come back, and those opportunities will be there. We're all very optimistic that things will return to normal hopefully soon. My final question before we kick it over to the audience: What advice do you have to share to soon-to-be graduates or young professionals during this time? Um, you know the old adage never waste a never waste a good crisis and i mean that in the way of there's a lot of lessons here you know when i go back and think about my now 37 year career and the different challenges that uh, the markets had gone through the economies had gone through a company had been through um, our clients had been through all of those were phenomenal learning lessons and so uh, as hard as it is at times, I think, to, to think this way, but really um, think about this and take the lessons away and, and save them. Because, you know, in some ways, I promise you, they will be there to be used again. And as you build on those lessons, I think you, be, you become better for them. And, you know, when you think about your lives and, and, you know, your learnings along the way, it's oftentimes that adversity that really helps shape you. And so while I know this is a challenge, um, take advantage of it and really study it and learn from it and take those lessons. And I, I really think they'll serve you well your entire careers. Thank you. It's really great advice. Now, we welcome everybody who's on the call to continue submitting questions via Q&A, not the chat box. I know it's a little confusing with the two offerings. We have a ton of questions from our audience members, so we'll start with our earlier ones. All right, first up, 
there have been a lot of discussions on the next normal and how that will fundamentally change people's behavior digitally. Are branches finally dying? And what city's digital strategy going forward? Well, you know, when you, you think about, it's a great question. And um, when you think about banking today, in many ways, uh, I, run, I run two banks. And one bank is the traditional analog bank of branches and physical presences and human interaction. And the second bank I run is a digital bank, um, you know, personified in everything from our mobile apps through our trading systems. And I think what we're, we're witnessing or seeing right now is that um, the analog bank is continually coming down in terms of size and in terms of interactions and the digital bank continues to build. But I think the challenge around that is, and again, I think it's, it's personified in this crisis that, you know, in spite of this crisis, we still have 60% of our branches open. People are still coming into those branches. They're expecting the branches to be there. But at the same time, as I described earlier, we've had significant uptake in terms of digital engagement. I hope that sticks. I hope we can continue to bring down the analog portion of our bank. But again, you know, when you look at society, you know, we've got uh, people in certain age groups that expect and want analog interaction. And we've got other people who probably haven't nor will ever come into one of our branches. And we've got to be there actually providing the full spectrum. Hopefully this acts as a catalyst to be able to, to push that along. And I actually think in our institutional business, in our, in our, in our trading platforms and our lending platforms and all of those, I think this just continues to push things forward. You know, last week is an example, our biggest trading floors in New York, we had 98% of our markets and security services people working remotely. Um, and again, volumes certainly at the end of March, early April have been unprecedented in terms of number of transactions, size of market transactions, market volatility, clearing, settlement, margin calls, all of those. And again, I think without uh, all the investments that we've made digitally, it never could have happened. That's great. We have another attendee who is wondering if you can talk about the impact of COVID-19 on US and China relations and cities business in China. Sure. Well, um, I think it's this, been, this has been described as um, a little bit first of its kind as a world war, but in this world war, we're all on the same side in terms of fighting, fighting COVID. Um, I think in here um, is a couple of things that, that I believe is one is I think in order to have a healthy functioning global economy, I think it's two bookends, the two largest economies in the world, both the US and China need to be in, in reasonable places. Um, I think the second, um, the second piece of that is that this likely will bring in, as we've seen from medical supplies, drugs, and other things, um, questions around supply chain and what's manufactured where. I think some of those things will be put back on the table, and I think you'll continue to see a, a realignment or redistribution of, uh, of the supply chains as we go into the future. And I think that we've learned whether it's been trade war or whether it's been COVID pandemic, that you, you can't be too concentrated in terms of your supply chains in any one place. I think you know China up until recently has probably been one of those places that has, been, uh, the ben has had the benefit of concentration moving its way. I think as part of trade and as part of this, I think we'll continue to see some diversification uh, away from that. And I think that as part of this, you know, the U.S. is going to need to, to really figure out um, what, what its engagement is, is China. What is it going to be? Is it going to be an ally? Is it going to be a competitor? Is it going to be a foe? And I think that that uh, really has yet to, to play out. And so um, that'll likely, you know, play out over the next few years. But I think those are those are important questions, and I think it, you know important things with significant ramifications on the broader, not just U.S. or China, but global economy. Our next question: What is your view on unlimited unlimited quantitative easing and its impact on the financial market, and is it sustainable? Well, I'm, I'm not a believer in in unlimited. I think the responses 
need to be measured to the to the situation. And I think the response that we've seen out of the, the U.S. obviously has been very significant in terms of the CARES Act and in terms of other uh, other actions taken. And we've seen that from from some other um, some other governments. Um, I think in here the response is right, but it certainly comes with the concept of moral hazard in terms of, you know, we're putting these monies out there, are they getting to the right place and, and uh, are people walking away with the right messages around safety nets? How do people think about uh, about the concept of broader bailouts? Um, and in how does this then change societal behavior? You know, in, in here, you know, we'll have people that are certainly affected uh, by the virus and deserve relief, but I also suspect we'll have people that weren't as affected, but expect that same relief anyway. And uh, I think it's a societal challenge and dilemma in terms of, of how we deal with that, and we'll likely have you know, ramifications into the future. Um, I think the, the second important piece is really around making sure that we don't save business yet destroy government and the credibility of government by by simply transferring the burden um, from uh, the economy at its grassroots level to the government where it actually creates a si situation where the debt burden that it's taken on is unsustainable. And then that clearly has a knock-on effect as part of that. And so uh, not a fan of unlimited. I think it needs to be appropriate, um, in many cases significant, but it can't overwhelm um, the government that's providing that safety net such that it creates a burden that really uh, destroys the credibility uh, or the long-term prospects of that economy beyond this. That makes sense. We have a question from a private banker at Citi who is wondering about the business of advice and if you could perhaps give an example or two of the characteristics of your favorite service providers and what makes them special. Well, I think that, that uh, the business of advice, um, you know, it probably hasn't been more valuable uh, for a long period of time, right? That there's a lot of questions out there. There's a lot of change occurring and that people clearly want help and guidance and counsel for that. So I think being in a position to have the benefit of, of understanding some of these things uh, and to be able to provide that I think is, is important and it's a, it's a, it's a privileged uh, position. Um, from my own perspective, the, the providers uh, that I like are the ones that um, provide services to me in the way that I, that I want them. And so again, I think uh, when I think about the application of that to banking, it's uh, when I want my my on demand, I've got my mobile app, and when I want a person to speak to to advice, they're there. So that the, the services and businesses that I like that are willing to provide um, those interactions in the way I want them when I want them, and I think that's probably right now the most powerful way of interacting. Sure. COVID-19 has already impacted Q1 results at banks. How severe do you think banks will be affected going forward and how fast will they likely recover? Well, um, I, again, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bifurcate a little bit in one in terms of, of U.S. banks and in particular the big U.S. banks. That Certainly from Citi's perspective, we went into this in a, in a very strong position, capital, liquidity, uh, you know, we've got about $150 billion of capital. We've got over $800 billion of liquidity available to us, risk metrics, et cetera. So um, Citi and the, the broader large banks of the U.S., I think, go into this in a, uh, in a, from, a, from a strong uh, position. We reported quarter one results yesterday, and I thought it was interesting that we actually had uh, our best revenue quarter since 2006 yesterday. But the story, not just for us, but for all the big banks around there, wasn't about your revenues or your expenses. It was really about credit and what we were likely seeing coming in terms of what's defined as cost of credit. How many delinquencies would we have? What would charge-offs be? Uh, it's very early, but we made the decision, uh, as, as did other big banks, to go ahead and start building reserves 
um, for the likelihood of increased cost of credit. And so um, right now, and those, those models are typically very dependent in particular on unemployment and around GDP. And I think we've, we've seen, and we saw the jobs number today, and we've seen the extrapolation that unemployment is likely headed in the near term much higher. That will cause stress, that will bleed into cost of credit. But again, I feel like we're in a, we're in a good position to be able to, to deal with that. And as I said early on, we've tried to be very engaged with our customers and with our clients around the challenges that they have and trying to find ways that they can work through that and we can work through it together. That's great. Our next question, are you concerned about the long-term prospects of your businesses in emerging markets given the unstable macroeconomic environments there? Yeah, you know, um, I think the way we've thought about it, again, as a company that comes to work in 100 countries every day, is everyone is different. And I think that what we've tried to do is, I think, apply a number of lenses to try and get the best sense we can of what the forward trajectory or path of countries look like in terms of how responsive have they been to the health pandemic? You know, have they acknowledged it? Have they taken early actions and are they de dealing with it in real time? Uh, the second piece around that is around the economic side. What capabilities do they have in terms of monetary and fiscal stimulus to put into the system? Do they have the wherewithal? And then what are the idiosyncratic challenges they may have around, as an example, oil shock, where we've seen the price of oil more than half itself in the last 30 or 45 days. And if, a, a, you know, as an example, if we, we see a country where they've, um, they've been slow to react from a health perspective, from a monetary and fiscal perspective, they don't have much wherewithal and they're very export or commodity export dependent, we know that it's very likely that that country is going to be very challenged. And, and then we come up with a plan of action against that. And again, as I think, as we look at in this question, uh, the emerging markets, I really think that it, it's, it doesn't, it's not the right thing to paint it with a single brush. I really think we have to go at it country by country, and it's going to be very uneven. And without a doubt, there's going to be some countries that are going to have significant challenges uh, as part of this. This morning, I don't know if you saw, but the IMF was on talking about programs that it's put in place to give access to fresh monies to these countries that are really in need. And again, I think those types of programs will certainly help. But without a doubt, and certainly in our own uh, estimations, growth is going to slow significantly, uh, not just in the developed markets, but the emerging markets as well. Sure. One of our attendees is wondering, uh, you, along with CEO peers of yours in the financial services industries, could potentially become thought partners with the president and government when it comes to figuring out how we reopen the economy. So what are your thoughts? How do we begin to open the economy and what will that process look like? Well, I think one is, you know, we've got to be mindful that this is a health crisis and that it's going to be very difficult to get the economy back to where we'd like it to be uh, without testing and ultimately without vaccination. But I think first we need prolific testing. We need testing to understand who has it. I think as we go back, I would, I would very much welcome and want the ability to test for who's had it. So that as we think about the reopening of the economy, and it's the way we think about the reopening of our company, what are those things that we can do in a safe way? What are those real essential things that we want people out or in our offices doing? And as we do that, how can we create an environment where we create the right health and safety standards around doing that? So I don't think this is going to be a big bang in terms of turning the economy back, back on. I think it's going to be sequenced. It's going to be sequenced in terms of the globe working its way from, from east to west, the same way the virus did. And by the way, when you just think of the U.S. today, we've got two to three week dispersions between where the stages of the virus are just within our own country. So as an example, um, as city reopens or as Columbia chooses to reopen, we've got to be mindful that we have people that are sheltering in place 
outside of New York where they may be coming from a different phase of this pandemic. And as we've seen in Asia, we've got to be mindful that as, as that's happened, we've seen rates go back up again. So we don't want to go through this simply to reintroduce it and have to go back, you know, go backwards in terms of, of some measures. And so I, I think it'll be uneven. Um, I think we need to be smart about it. And I know that um, uh, government officials, and understandably so, want to get things reopened as quickly as possible. But I think we've got to be smart and safe about it. And again, really dealing with it first as a health issue, and then we'll deal with the economics. Absolutely. We have another attendee who works in banking, JP Morgan, who was very close to the implementation of the Paycheck Protection Program. This person is curious to hear your thoughts on the way that the Treasury put the Paycheck Protection Program into effect, how the big banks responded, how effective you think the program will be, and if additional funding will be headed this way in the future. Yeah, great, great question. And um, I don't know if you, you had a chance to see, but effectively, all of the $350 billion as of this morning has been dispersed. And if you think about that and put that in context, it's extraordinary that in the um, in a normal year, and I went back and looked at the SBA, the Small Business Administration, 2017, 2018, 2019, on average, they lent about $28, 29000000000 billion per year. So uh, the program was launched on April 3rd. Today is April 16th. That's 13 days. We dispersed $350 billion. If my math is right, that's just about $28 billion a day over those 13 days. So we did, as a banking system, every day what was a typical year for the SBA. So one, I think we have to understand the magnitude of it. Um, Second is, in any of these programs, when you're standing something up at that scale, it's not easy. And, you know, when you think about getting those monies to small business, um, what's the application process like? What's the validation process like? Who takes responsibility around certain aspects of that documentation? Ultimately, how is it approved and how is the money dispersed? I would say there were certainly... Uh, some growing pains or what I would call some scaling challenges early on. But again, to get $350 billion out in 13 days, I think is pretty extraordinary. Uh, and I think there were some, some lessons learned around that. And as I said, you know, we're getting ready to, uh, to um, uh, launch with the government the Main Street program. That'll be $600 billion. And I think as a lesson learned there, one of our suggestions back to the Fed and back to Treasury is rather than kind of saying that this is live, give us a week to get the infrastructure set up and tested so that we don't create the frustrations of people and business in the process so that when we hit the button and say we're ready to go, we're ready to go, as opposed to uh, kind of hitting the button and then in real time, people working 24 hours a day and through the weekend and, and trying to get, get this thing to life. But um, again, I think that as that mechanism between fiscal and, 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 and monetary and the real economy, I think the banking system is doing a terrific job. We've received quite a few questions from students who are heading into banking or full-time roles over the summer. Uh, one in particular, for those heading into banking this summer, do you see certain coverage groups being impacted more than others given the pandemic? And what are your thoughts on the overall size of incoming classes? Will they be shrinking, staying the same? Well, I think it's early to tell. From, from our perspective, you know, uh, we, we've extended our offers and our classes are our classes and we're gonna bring everybody in and we're gonna gauge everyone in whatever we can do uh, as that time approaches. So I, I think it's early to, to think about what um, uh, what the next years will look like, and we'll kind of think about that and deal with it based on the, the best information we have at the time. And, you know, I would argue that we should, within reason, um, delay those decisions, certainly if we're thinking about making things smaller uh, for as long as we can without causing hardship on, on either side. Um, I think in, in terms of, um, you know, my suspect is, is 
you, you don't have this amount of stimulus coming into an economy. You don't have these types of challenges or changes without lots of things to work on. So I fully expect as things begin to renormalize that we're going to be very busy and that, you know, there's going to be lots uh, for our people to do uh, along the lines of helping our companies because I think our companies, as we described in many ways, are going to be rethinking lots of things around their business models. Our consumers are going to be thinking things probably a bit different. And so I think there's uh, there's lots to do, and I expect that uh, engagement will be high and that our people will be busy. Great. Our next question is about stock buybacks. Is it your belief that corporate America, including the banks, is overlevered, or should companies continue repurchasing shares through the crisis? Well, we, we along with um, a number of uh, my other Big bank colleagues made the decision in mid-March that we would suspend our buyback programs, uh, again, around the uncertainty of where this was headed, and as a, uh, a precaution uh, around just having more capital. And so, um, again, I think from, from a bank perspective, you know, banks have the ability to generate large amounts of capital. And I would remind people that... Um, you know, buybacks, I believe, are, are, are an important part of the system. And in banking, uh, if we don't return that capital to our shareholders, we would need to put that capital to work. And so in putting that capital to work, um, as an example, we've had loan growth over the last five, six, seven, eight years ahead of global GDP. And for an institution our size, I'm not sure that I want to be growing at two to three times GDP. I'm not sure that's good growth. And so when you think of an institution like ours and the other big banks that have a $2 trillion balance sheet, I'm okay growing somewhere around to a bit ahead of GDP, but I don't want to grow ahead of that. And so what we've said is rather than forcing that growth out, really seeking that growth to give that money back to our shareholders to keep as much as we need to run our institution and to, to run it prudently and to be there for our clients and return the balance. Right now, we've said in that, we're going to withhold that capital to see how this plays through. And then as opportunities or as situations present themselves, we'll, we will readjust uh, our capital and return plans around that. Great. Our next question. What efforts is City and Peer Banks making to protect those who are hardest hit by the pandemic, namely those who are going to have massive hits to their credit scores without income and the ability to pay credit card debt, mortgage, the like? So what we have, as I said, we, we were the first bank in the, in the U.S. in early March to put in place uh, stated programs. Uh, and I think in many ways, we, we went back and and dusted off some of the things that we had done in the in the 08 crisis. Um, and so one is that we are offering forbearances to people affected by COVID on their mortgages, on their student loans, uh, on their credit cards. And so provided that you've come into this situation in good or reasonable standing, um, we'll give you payment holidays, et cetera, uh, for a period of time where you don't have to make those those payments, and again, uh, for right now, depending on the program, those are 60 and 90 day programs. Typically, they need to be signed off by the banking regulators as being acceptable as things we can do. We've gotten those approvals. And then again, uh, you know, if things, you know, continue challenged or get worse, we'll be continuing to modify, uh, be continuing to modify those programs. Uh, good news is yesterday, uh, we saw um, a, a large number of those checks going out to people, hit their accounts. One of the things that we're doing is we're preventing debt collectors from having the ability to come in and sweep those monies out of the accounts. That's something that the city's doing, and we hope others follow as part of that because we think it'd be a shame to see that money hit and for those people not to have it be their decision in terms of how they use that money. Um, and again, I think it's, it's kind of being there and staying in touch with people and 
um, whether it's digitally or whether it's analog, being there for that outreach to help people. Great. Our next question. After 2008, there was a massive regulatory clampdown, of course, on investment banks. Given the recent volatility in the markets, do you think we will see further risk reduction and lower risk appetite in the future? Um, well, again, I go back to 2008 really was a financial crisis. And I think that the regulation that was put in place at that time was meant to deal with that. I think this time being different in that this is a health crisis and really that um, the banks in particular are here uh, really trying to, to help, not the source of the problem. And so I don't expect that you'll see um, much or a lot of new regulation come out of this for uh, the, the, the regulated banking system today. We may have other things that come, you know, as an example, um, uh, again, in my 37 years, uh, the commercial paper market uh, has been there and every crisis, the commercial paper market has failed and that someone's had to intervene and I could see things coming in and potentially kind of changing the nature of some of those things, which is probably, uh, which is probably appropriate. And I think from a, a risk perspective, I, I think that certainly we believe our risk appetite framework and the way that we went into this uh, is right for us that, you know, we are a bank, we do lend money, we will not always be right, but in our risk appetite framework, that can't be outsized to who we are. So, you know, the system will take losses, but those losses can't and shouldn't be outsized. I, I don't uh, hopefully expect them to be. And I think some of the extraordinary government programs in place will certainly uh, help with that. Um, and, uh, and I think overall, I think you'll continue to see people learn from this in terms of lending standards. But again, I don't, I don't think you're going to see a, a significant change to lending standards in the regulated banking industry coming out of this. Thank you. There has, of course, been much debate over what the recovery to the economy will look like. What are your thoughts? Do you think it will be V-shaped, U-shaped, L-shaped, something else? And how long do you think until we return back to normal or to our new normal? You know, that's, that's, the, that's the question of the day. Um, I would say that I, I, at this point, significantly discount a V-shaped recovery and if you go back to what I talked about, about to the likely unevenness of this recovery, uh, I think that significantly discounts the likelihood of a, a V-shaped recovery. Um, and I think the question, is it U-shaped? I think in parts it will be. Is it W-shaped? In parts it could be. And so W-shape is where you get a recovery to again um, have challenges. And, and in here, I think depending as an example on certain uh, debt loads, certain indebtedness levels that either people or companies come out of this, and then how quickly parts of the economy return to growth could dictate that. And then I think there are other parts of the economy where realistically you could have the more challenged L-shaped recovery for a, a, a period to a potentially extended period of time. So I think it's I think it's going to be I think it's going to be mixed, and unfortunately I don't think it's going to be a V. Our next question, what is your view on the bailout and the proportionality between its support for individuals versus businesses? Well, I think that, that um, you know, when you think of small business and when you think of uh, the, the, the word you use in terms of bailout, if we just look at the payroll protection program uh, that we just talked about, what is that really about? It, it's, it's in the title. It's about protecting people's jobs. And so while that money goes to a company, again, around the terms of the program, that company receives effectively 75 days of payroll around its, its staff for small business. And provided that money is used for that, the money is actually forgiven. So that money is a direct pass through to those employees. And the trade-off is, is if those people aren't employed, they're going to be effectively filing for unemployment. And so I think what you're really trying to weigh is, is one side versus the other. And again, I think that a, a lot of the challenge here is really around trying to keep people in jobs such that as the economy turns back on, that we actually have those people employed and we can get the economy up and running 
uh, really as, as quickly as possible with the least amount of dislocation that's possible. So again, while these monies may be going to companies, the vast, vast majority is there and it's meant to support the people who work at those companies. Thank you. Our next question, we have so many questions. This is great, everybody. Are there specific areas that you would like to see Cities Innovation Lab focus on in the coming months? Um, you know, we run, we run innovation labs in a number of um, cities and countries around the world. We uh, run one on the West Coast in, in San Francisco and Palo Alto that's largely focused on consumer and consumer behavior. We run a lab in Dublin, which is focused really on corporate and commercial money movement and payments. We run a lab in Tel Aviv that's focused on markets. Uh, we run a innovation lab in Singapore that's kind of uh, one of our test sites where we actually roll out uh, different consumer experiments around different types of applications and, and devices. Um, so I, I think from, from our perspective, how do we take some of the lessons of human behaviors in this crisis and figure out ways of either delivering or delivering those better? And again, I think with the, um, the ways that we've seen our applications and devices used, I think there's some, some really interesting takeaways. You know, for people, it, it's interesting that uh, there's the old adage that don't listen to what people say, watch what they do. And I think that this period of time is giving us some really interesting insights to behaviors and, uh, and how, we, how we drive our channels properly against that. And so um, I'd love to see us take advantage of the information and the data and the experience that we've had here to continue to improve. That's great. Our next. Oh, sorry, it's on mute for a minute. Thank you. What are some consumer shifts that you see coming due to COVID-19 and what industries do you think could benefit from these shifts? I'm sorry, what was the first part of the question? Uh, what are some of the consumer shifts that you see coming out of COVID? Oh, well, again, I think that, you know, it hasn't just been in banking, but obviously we've seen people forced to live big parts of their lives digitally. So how does that change behaviors um, uh, of everything from shopping to dining to travel? Um, and we'll see uh, how those how those things play forward. What has a permanence to it uh, and, and what doesn't? And then um, the adjustments uh, as a company, adjustments as a society that we need to we need to be able to make to um, to, to go against those. Great. Once the pandemic is over, since the government is sending so much aid forth, will inflation dramatically increase after the crisis? You know, um, interesting because, you know, we've we've seen really since the great financial crisis, not just in the U.S., but around the world, unprecedented levels of uh, monetary policy and um, and stimulus come in. And you would have expected by now that that would be manifesting itself in higher levels of inflation than we have seen. Again, uh, I think some of the actions that we're seeing here are truly extraordinary. Uh, it's early to tell, and I think part of it depends on, on the pace and shape of the recovery uh, that lies ahead of us and what pressures, inflationary pressures, that will put uh, on. I, I think that we're, um, you know, from an inflation perspective, uh, fortunate that from uh, a labor perspective, we were coming from a very high level of employment, and yet we really hadn't seen significant amounts of, of wage pressure uh, across most uh, across most industries or big parts of the economy. So we'll, we'll see how this plays forward. I'm so, it's likely we'll we'll get some bubbles or we'll get some challenges in there. But right now, I, I don't necessarily see or fear. And I think if that's a if that's a derivative of this, it's it's one that you know is likely necessary. Uh, or, or was worth the risk in terms of trying to stabilize and bring 
not just the U.S., but the global economy back as quickly as we can. Thank you. How do you think this pandemic changes the way we look at the underbanked, given how this disease has really impacted this population most severely? And how does that change or propel city strategy moving forward? Well, it, it has, right? It, this is, this is in, in some ways, um, you know, has, has again de delineated or, or bright lined some of the, the social challenges and economic challenges that we have. And uh, in here, just as an example, um, in the implementation of the, um, the monies going out, the $1,200 going out to a number of people, uh, you know, we saw for those who had accounts, the abilities to get those monies in and the ability for us to basically process and, uh, and free those monies to be used very quickly, you know, much more difficult for those people that don't have bank accounts. Right, in terms of their abilities to get those check those checks cashed, or one is to get the check, and we worry about um, you know people uh, theft of trying to get it or fraud happening as as part of that, and then in some cases the exorbitant fees that that um, certain places charge to be able to cash those checks. So, you know, one of the products that we created a while back um, in concert with the FDIC and others was a, a product called the access, the access product, which is really was really initially meant to go at the underbanked. And what the access product is, it is basically a fee-free account. There is no minimum balance. You cannot overdraft the account. We give you uh, an ATM card such that you have that. And the only stipulation that we have around being fee-free fee -free, is either you have direct deposit from your employer or you have two standing payments that you make a month from that account. And if you qualify for either one of those, the account is completely free. What's interesting about it is we did that trying to promote um, uh, something that made sense to the unbanked or underbanked. But what's been interesting is that has been actually our largest account opening across across the bank that is an introductory account for everybody it's a great introductory account kind of coming in and then you can add on or bolt on services to that as you want so uh, as a company we're, we're trying to make sure that we put the the products out there um, uh, another example you know that we do is uh, around uh, banks that operate in minority neighborhoods we allow those banking customers fee free access to our ATMs when they're in areas where our uh, our banks are. Um, clearly, uh, our foundation is out there trying to promote financial education and inclusion, not just in the U.S. Uh, but around the world. And um, this is an issue. We've made some progress against it, but still a lot of work to do. Great. Where do you envision city will be in five to 10 years from now? Well, um, you know, my vision is, is that we will be a preeminent bank. And I don't say digital bank because I think in order to be a preeminent bank, digital is going to have to be at your core. And I think, you know, we will remain focused around the consumer markets that we operate in, as well as I think distinguishing ourselves in terms of our globality with our, our companies and in particular our multinational companies and the services that we can provide. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, continuing to build on the terrific foundation that we have. Great. Um, our next question, in a COVID world, many children are moving back in with their parents and other extended family members are locating with one another. How has this personally impacted you? And what have you learned from perhaps being in closer proximity to your children and other family members during the crisis? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think from our perspective, I am sheltering in place with my wife and my son, who is a student at Columbia Business School, as, as well as his wife here with us. And I think we've um, had to kind of come up with our, our rules and our boundaries. Uh, and as I said early on, you know, we, we had some challenges in terms of internet and Wi-Fi and how we do that. We've managed to solve that. Um, uh, I've had to uh, take on my share of the daily chores, 
right? That, you know, I've, I've had to reacquaint myself with loading the dishwasher and how, how the, you know, how a vacuum works and all those types of things. Um, but again, it's a, it's a family effort. And, and, and in here, I think the ability to, to spend time and to kind of not miss the opportunity as a family <clears throat> to be together in, you know, what's, what's extraordinary and won't, won't last forever and, you know, kind of walk away from it all, all, all better, uh, all better understanding each other and, and the things that we do. That's great. I do want to be mindful of time. I know we've had a ton of questions so far. So this will be our final question from Mike. How do you think CBS students, particularly our first year students, should approach the job market and job search in 2021? Um, again, I think it's, it's uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this plays forward. But again, I, I would um, cast the net uh, wide. I would um, go out and, and, you know, engage as early as practically possible uh, around, around that. Um, uh, again, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't take the environment and allow the environment to be discouraging to me. And I would, you know, prepare myself because, you know, as this turns, uh, business industry, society is going to be looking for well-trained, smart people who can step in and do jobs right away. And I think you all certainly qualify for that. And I think it's, it's likely about a little bit of patience and a lot of perseverance, and I'm sure it's going to work out well. Excellent. Really great final advice. Thank you so much again, Mike, for your time and building time into your schedule to chat with us. This was really, really insightful, and we'll take all of your advice with us as we move forward. Thank you. I appreciate the time today and, and everybody participating, and everybody stay healthy. Thank you.